All right, guys, welcome back in. Good morning, River City Church. Are we on? Are we on? Here we go. All right, man, such a great day. There's nothing like Promotion Sunday. Um, super, super fun. If you're new, welcome, guys. We're just so happy to have you. Uh, my name is Tim. Woo! Yeah. <laughs> I'm on staff here. I'm one of the pastors here. Um, I was formerly the director of student ministry, but went through a little, uh, a little change in my role, and so it's exciting, but I just, I'm always going to love days like today when students are going back to school and going to the next grade, and it's just so exciting for those, those rising sixth graders to join the youth ministry. I'm so pumped about it. Um, so let's go ahead and talk about the elephant in the room for a minute, which I know I'm, people are still pointing out as if I don't know that I have a mustache. <laughs> They're still pointing that out. And you know, for all of you who have just celebrated, like I have, I've received some of the nicest, most kind, um, complimentary remarks about my mustache. I've also received some major hate, <laughs> discrimination, hate emails, death threats, no, no. Um, the word creep has come out on more occasions than once. Creeper, um, unsafe for kids, um, and uh, it's kind of a new look. And Melissa still hasn't accepted it yet. She, she's still in the first stage of grief, <laughs> anger, <laughs> you know, and next is denial, and then it just go, so on and so forth. But there'll, there'll be a time when she might accept it. Um, and, you know, I don't know, like, you know, it's always been there. Let's... So it's, it was just waiting to arrive, you know? <laughs> we don't know. We don't just, it had its, its time. And um, actually, this is really funny. We have a little Airbnb thing going on at our house. And um, I got to meet one of our guests last week. And Melissa hadn't met him yet. And she said, oh, you met the Airbnb guest? I was like, yeah, like, really? You know, and she was like, what's he like? I was like, he's got a mustache. <laughs> like, what else do you need to know? His name's Rick. He drives a red Chevrolet. Like, he's got a mustache. <laughs> um, <laughs> But anyway, so yes, I do have a mustache. I don't know how long it's going to be there. Time will tell. Um, but yeah, I do want to just uh, take a minute, you know, coming back to RCC. It's so good to be back with everybody. But just coming back, I just want to take a minute just to honor. I know several of the youth leaders are actually running youth right now. But just to say, like, I just love our youth ministry. And I'm so thankful for our youth leaders being willing just to rally this summer, including Jocelyn and everyone else, to do Passion Camp. Those of you in the room who went to Passion Camp. Um, I was so encouraged by all the testimonies of the students who shared a, a few weeks back about Passion Camp. Just couldn't help but cry thinking about, you know, what God was doing in their lives. Um, and so now I, I was the youth director. I'm stepping into a new role here at RCC. Um, it's called the Community Life Pastor is my official um, title. And what I'm going to be doing in this next season is I'm going to be just kind of focusing on spiritual formation for people and um, helping people become attentive to God in their life and in all areas of their life. Um, and the second part of it is helping people um, connect with our community, our church, and get plugged into the life of the church, but to connect with God through community. And so I'm going to be overseeing and helping and supporting and praying for our city groups. And, and we have some really exciting stuff happening soon with city groups, which I'll tell you about a little bit later. Um, but I'm just going to walk you guys through. I know I'm sitting down. This is different. I just felt like I just need to sit because this is kind of like a day where I get to tell my story of the sabbatical. I took a six-week sabbatical and I was like, okay, I think this is the day where I just can kind of share um, what God did in me uh, throughout that time of my sabbatical because God had, has done a work in my life and he's continuing to do work, but he started something new in me and I just wanted to kind of share that. So um, I got to take a six-week sabbatical um, and it was cool. The first week I had a week of solitude. Um, Melissa and I had a week together where we got to go on a really fun trip together to Montana, which was just beautiful and just unfathomably amazing um, so peaceful. And then we had a time with our whole family. We took a couple of family trips. We went to go see the life-size version of Noah's Ark, which was kind of crazy and awesome. Um, but just intentional time with family and just taking a step back from ministry and work just to be fully, fully present with my kids. It was amazing. It, it felt like 
Gosh, it was just so good just to be with them and not thinking about anything else, but just like what God wanted me to, to pour into them at this stage of their life. They're six, you know, five and three. So these are just, you know, they're just times we're never going to get back, y'all. <laughs> um, but anyway, I got to do some fishing. Any fishers in the room? Anyone like fishing? Yeah, I've caught a big, oh, yeah, that's not me. <laughs> no, what's next is actually me. I know he looks like me, but that, yeah, that, that's, a, you know, but it was sport fishing, okay? We're sport fishing, it's fly fishing, all right? And I was up in Chatt the Chattahoochee River, it was the north part of the river, so that's all, that's actually the biggest thing you will catch out there, I'm just letting you know, okay? Um, <laughs> I, did, I did some fishing. And it was just soul filling, right? Like it's relaxing, it's, it's fun. And most of what I did really was just <sighs> take a breath, right? Just take a breath and spend time in prayer, spend time in the word. Um, and you know, I'll just tell you a little bit about where I was before my sabbatical and where I had been maybe for a, a little while. And some of you who I've spoken with already know, know this, but um, you know, we had a men's first Monday this past Monday and Jared had us doing this um, pace assessment, which is really a, an exercise that we did as men to kind of talk about what are our Sabbath rhythms as we think about starting work, you know, and work kind of revving up in the fall, kids going back to school, the complications of schedules and lots of lobbying for times and carpooling and all this kind of stuff. What is your pace, you know? And then one of the questions was about your energy levels with your Sabbath rhythms. And it was basically about like, you know, on a scale of one to five, you know, how do you, um, where are your energy levels at and how do you respond to what's going on in life and kind of what are your spiritual levels with your Sabbath rhythm? And, and I was reading it and I was like, okay, where, where am I now? Which, which feels awesome to say it's higher up on the list, but before my time of sabbatical, I was kind of like, between a two and a three, often just kind of sitting at a two, um, which is like your legs are wobbly. At three is your legs are wobbly. You feel like your legs are wobbly. You're just trying to keep up a little bit. And two is you're kind of running on fumes, right? You're just like trying to make the best of what you've got going on in sort of survival mode in a sense, which I think anyone with young kids is sort of, you know, feeling that from time to time. But, um, but I... Um, I just felt like, you know, I was. I felt like I was close to kind of burning out in ministry, just feeling overwhelmed. And I was wanting to find a place of, of rest. Um, and I would take time off work. And I would, you know, I'd take time to chill and do fun stuff, you know, and watch a show and that kind of stuff. But it wasn't like, it wasn't helping. Like, I wasn't getting filled up. And, it, and I actually was, you know, dealing with anxiety at times, um, wanting peace from the Lord to kind of cover that anxiety, but not really experiencing like true shalom, like true peace in my heart. And so I went into the sabbatical knowing I needed change. And I was like, if I'm going to continue on serving in ministry at RCC, I'm going to need to go through like some spiritual formation and some transformation and to kind of get back to, yeah, the heart of um, what I believe and what we're doing and um, just my life, perf my life purpose, really. Um, and so I was, I was ready for God to bring me into this new place of love, and I just really wanted to see Jesus again, like in a real way, and to experience Jesus in a real way. And when I was there, I was in North Georgia, kind of just soaking up the mountains and the hiking and the fishing and, and just reading and praying. And I came across this, this verse, and I was just like, Jesus, I want to see, see you. Like, I want to experience you again. Like, I, I need a, a, a refreshing. I need a renewal. Like, I need a spiritual renewal. And I came across this verse. as reading John 14. I came across uh, verse 21. It says, Jesus says, the one who has my commandments and keeps them is the one who loves me. And the one who loves me will be loved by my Father. And I will love him and will reveal myself to him. And I was like, that's what I need. That's what I need. I need, I need Jesus to reveal himself to me because it feels like it's been a long time since I've really seen and experienced him. And so today I'm going to be kind of talking about um, that but his commandments, about the two great commandments that Jesus gives. And the two great commandments are love God and love others. And 
how my sabbatical journey was kind of this, this story of like God bringing me back to that life purpose of loving him and from that place of loving him, kind of getting back to a real genuine, you know, love that flows out for others. So Jared had assigned two books for me for my sabbatical. One was called The Secrets of the Secret Place by Bob Sorge, and I started that immediately. If you haven't read that book, it's an incredible book. Um, and I started immediately, God started speaking to me, just I'm about, almost about how much I was missing because um, he talks all about the secret place of prayer with God. And I was realizing how much I was missing just reading it going, wow, yeah, I'm a pastor, but I'm missing out on this secret place of prayer that brings life. And the other book was called The Critical Journey, The Six Stages of the Life of Faith. And I was about three days in, and when you're by yourself and you're used to family, hustle, bustle, life, being together all the time, when you're by yourself in the mountains, you're kind of like, this is weird. Like, this is very strange. I am by myself. I'm having time alone. You don't get that often, you know, with young kids. And, you know, so I started really just thinking through, and I'm like, you know what I'm going to do? Like, I'm just going to soak up this time to read. And so I don't want to just, I, I want to just fish the whole time. <laughs> but I was like, I know I shouldn't just fish the whole time. You know, so I'm like, okay, I'm going to go for like a little hike. I'm going to try to find this like perfect little spot next to some stream and read The Critical Journey. And I'm just going to like camp out there. And I know God's just going to like use this to like form me and shape me. And so I'm driving from Hiawassee up to Hendersonville, North Carolina, between uh, places that I was staying. And I cross over this Appalachian trailhead and I see all these cars that are parked out there. And, and so I, I roll down my window when these two hikers come by and they've got the whole gear, like they've been on like a long hike, you know? And they've got their trekking poles and everything. And I, and I say, hey guys, what is this about? Like, is this a good hike? And they're like, oh yeah, you gotta do this hike. Like, it's amazing. It's Siler Bald, you know, you, when you get to the top, there's this 360 degree panoramic view of all the mountainscapes in North Carolina. I'm like, that's where I want to read, you know, that's where I want to read my book. And so I'm like, okay, well, how long is it? And, uh, you know, it's like 2.30 in the afternoon. I'm looking for like a mile hike, right? Like something real short and nice, you know, which is, I don't know why I was thinking that I would find that there. Never ask an Appalachian trail hiker how long a hike is. They never know. Like, they've been going for miles and miles, and they're like, oh, it's like a couple miles, like maybe one and a half, two miles. And uh, it was five miles. So <laughs> I, I take half a bottle of water. I've got this bottle. It's half full. And I just start going. I'm like, yes, Jesus, I got my backpack. I leave my phone in the car. I leave everything that I need for survival. Like, I don't have it. And this is great, right? I'm already adventuring on my sabbatical. And, and I'm, I'm going on this trail. And guys, I'm like, I can do a mile and a half, two miles easy. So I'm like, I'm going to just run this trail. You know, I've got my, I'm like, yeah. And I'm two, I'm two miles in and these hikers to go the other direction. I'm like, hey, guys, I'm like looking for this place. I have no map. I'm like, is it anywhere near? They're like, no, you're not anywhere near <laughs> Tyler Bald. And so I'm like, you know, I can turn back now, but like, I'm just going to push through and see what happens. And <laughs> two miles later, more hikers are like, yeah, you're getting kind of close, but you know, and then I got some bad directions from this lady who I think maybe was an angel because, you know, she, you know, she was just by herself and she was in her, you know, early seventies just hiking. And I was like, who are you? You know, <laughs> like, and I was like five miles in and I get, I get, but I finally get to the top and I'm like, oh, this is amazing. There's, there is this beautiful panoramic view, and I'm exhausted. I sit down with a book, and I have no time to read because I've got to get back because it's getting dark. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, great. And I get through three pages of this book, and I'm reading it, and the whole first chapter is about how faith for a Christian is a life of response to God and how when you go on the journey of faith, you, you're going to go through different stages in your life, but when you take the journey of faith, it's not like going on a trip, like a trip, you, a trip to the store. You can sort of just go on a whim and then come back and whatever, it's fine. But like when you go on a journey, you have to get prepared for a journey. Like you have to, you have to go through the steps of putting together the list of essential things that you're going to need, food, water, all of it, you know. And I was just laughing. I'm like reading this going, this is hilarious, the irony, because that was totally my story today. And I'm just there, and, I, and it was like God was like, get ready like for a journey of reorientation that I'm going to take you on. 
And I, I realized pretty, pretty soon into my sabbatical that one of the main things that I was missing in my life was just time with Jesus. And that was one of the main things that was taking away from my life and, and from my peace and my joy. And um, he took me on this journey of reorienting me around his word and his presence because I had allowed work and activities and relationships to take the place of like really loving God. And you know, I, not in theory, like in theory, I, I loved God and I wanted to serve him and, and I wanted a relationship, but in action, how I was actually spending my time, but also in my heart's affection because I wasn't hearing his voice. So, so my heart's affection, my heart was, was feeling far and, and distant from him. And, and then I realized later that really there was some kind of idolatry working in my life. And, you know, I like this quote, Dr. Uh, Paul Tripp, who also has an excellent mustache, I must say. Um, he says, idolatry is not just being enslaved to bad things. Idolatry is when good things become ruling things. You know, and I had let a lot of good things happening in my life become ruling things, the main things. I was giving my time and my attention and my focus to them. And so, and that was something that the Lord was showing me is that when we pursue anything above loving God and spending time listening to him, whether it be work or money, things, security, activities, health, even relationships with others, these pursuits will leave us feeling unfulfilled and, and, and it will leave our life feeling out of balance. And so what I found out in this journey that I'm still on is like as I really lean in and take time to, to listen to Jesus, I, I realize that listening to and loving God in the secret place is the key to unlocking every area of my life and fulfillment in my life. And it's not a magic trick. Like, it's not this instantaneous, you just sit there and you pray, and suddenly you're just super happy and excited. It's not like that, but... It's a, it's a recipe, it's a rhythm and a recipe for finding fulfillment in the deepest place of your life is by taking time to listen to and love the Lord in response. And so I'll say that a lot of this talk is about how life starts with listening. Um, there's, there's, a, there's something in the Old Testament called the Shema. And my grandfather, who was in ministry for 40 years, my dad's dad, my dad's here uh, joining us today, my dad's dad, who we call Papadi, I was out to lunch with him a few years ago, and he, he brought this to my attention, and he was trying to teach me something. And I couldn't really hear it at the time, but um, he said, you know what one of the most important words in the whole Bible is? And I was like, no, but I know you're going to tell me, right? <laughs> you know? And he was like, it's, it's the Shema. It's, it's the Shema. And the Shema for Jews is like the centerpiece of um, the daily and, and morning and evening prayer services for Judaism and is actually, according to myjewishlearning.com, is <laughs> considered one of the most important prayers of all of Judaism, the Shema. This is something that they pray morning and, and night. And um, the Shema is found in Deuteronomy chapter 6, and it's after Moses has given the Ten Commandments to Israel and he is addressing the new generation, the second generation, who's about to go into the promised land. And before, before he does, the Lord speaks through him the Shema. And so I'm going to read this. Um, Deuteronomy 6, 4 through 12 says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. Impress them on your children. Talk about them when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. Tie them as symbols on your hands and bind them to your foreheads. Write them on the door frames of your houses and on your gates. When the Lord your God brings you into the land that he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you a land with large, flourishing cities that you did not dig, I'm sorry, that you did not build, houses filled with all kinds of good things that you did not provide, wells that you did not dig, and vineyards and olive groves 
you did not plant. Then when you eat and are satisfied, be careful that you do not forget the Lord who brought you up out of Egypt, out of the land of slavery. And what a promise of God to Israel. Just here's, here's what I want. Just love, love me. And guys, I'm just going to lead you into the fullness of blessing in your life. And the first part of the Shema, he says, the Lord is one. You know, this is not a, um, I think a lot of people have taken this to be a Trinitarian type statement. This is not a uh, Trinitarian. You can go back to that first verse if you would. Um, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. This is not about, um, you know, establishing monotheism, um, although that was a part of the, their, um, the culture and the religious culture. But um, the Shema, and what we see here is this is a pledge of allegiance. This is a pledge of allegiance to the Lord God of Israel that excludes allegiances to any other gods. And these gods were real for the people of the surrounding cultures. These were real gods that they actually believed were real, right? And so the Shema comes in stark contrast saying, pledge allegiance to completely loving Jehovah God, to completely giving and abandoning any ties with any other gods, which is all part of the commandments and we know if we've read Deuteronomy. But, um, but what I want us to focus on for a second is this idea of love which this idea of love is the Hebrew word, which is ahava, which is kind of fun to say. You guys want to say it? Ahava. Yeah, it's kind of nice. It really flows. Ahava, this is a uh, affectionate, but also an active type of love. You know, it's not just this idea of love. It's an active love. It's about faithful obedience to God's covenant. And it was an obedience, not in legalism to earn God's favor, but it was an, it was an obedience because of love and listening to the voice of the Lord, right? But then uh, I want you to also notice, going back a verse, to back to the hero Israel, the first word here. This is quite possibly the most important word for any of us to grab out of this whole thing because, you know, they actually named the prayer after this. Hear, Shema. Shema means to hear, okay? So the point of this is that it starts with hearing, It starts with hearing the voice of God. God is calling to Israel. Tim Mackey from the Bible Project, if you've ever heard of the the Bible Project, um, you know who Tim Mackey is. If you haven't, I encourage you to go YouTube some Bible Project videos. They're just excellent, excellent resources for learning the Bible. But he says, the opening line, uh, this is a quote, hero Israel does not simply mean to let sound waves enter your ears. Here, the word Shema means to allow the words to sink in, provide understanding, and generate a response. It's about action. In Hebrew, hearing and doing are the same thing. Bob Sorge says this in his book, Secrets of the Secret Place, everything in the kingdom depends on whether or not we hear the word of God. I will endure months of silence if he will speak but one creative word from his mouth to my spirit. The wisest thing you'll ever do in this life is draw close to God and seek him with all of your heart. Isn't that beautiful? And when you apply this to the concept of faith, I love, I love what you see. It takes amazing meaning. Um, if, you, if you think about our faith, a lot of people will think of faith as this set of ideas or beliefs that you have, right? My faith is, well, I'm a Christian. Like I have a set of ideas or beliefs that I'm devoted to. But I think a better definition of faith is a loving response to God. It's an actual loving response. It's an action step toward God after hearing him speak. I think that's a, that's a better way of thinking about the word faith. Romans 10, 17 says, faith comes by hearing. Faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. The Shema is not a prayer as a set of beliefs as much as it is a life response to God. So taking it a step further, Christianity, what we believe, it's not just a set of beliefs. It's actually about who we believe and who we love. It's about a connection with Jesus. It's about a deep, loving connection with Jesus. Tim Mackey says this, this is my last Tim Mackey quote. He says, following Jesus is about love. And as we receive Jesus' love, we respond with gratitude. 
humility, and a commitment to honor and love him in return. Love generates more love, which results in faithfulness and obedience. These are truths that can transform us from the inside out. You know, I want that to just sink in. Love generates more love. You know, I've, I didn't, it's so funny. I didn't know that it was a morning and nightly prayer of Judaism, but I started praying this over my kids when they were babies, really. We, I started doing it every night with them. Um, I don't pray it in the morning because I don't have a lot of love in me in the morning, <laughs> you know, just, um, but I pray, that, I pray this prayer with them at night, you know, and I, and I go in and I, it's fun and they love it because, you know, I, I say, Lord, I pray that Ellie loves you with all of her heart and I point to her heart, her soul, and I just place my hand on her chest, her mind, and I point to her, her head and her strength and I kind of squeeze, squeeze her arm and they just like, they love it. They eat it up every night and they ask for it and then they've started doing it back to me, which is such a sweet thing, you know, when your kids start praying things back over you and they just eat it up. But I just, I want them to know that like what we walk in and what we practice is about love. It's about loving God. You know, it's about having a love relationship with God. And I want them to know that early on. But you know, um, this is Old Testament verse, right? But Jesus actually validates and affirms the Shema in three out of the four gospels. Um, And if you think about Jesus as a, you know, first century Jewish rabbi, he probably would have prayed this prayer often, if not on a daily basis, Jesus would have been praying the Shema. Um, somebody came to Jesus and said, and, and, and I'll say this, it was often associated with eternal life. You know, someone said, how can I get into heaven? Jesus said, have you loved the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind? One time somebody comes to him and says, um, what's the most important commandment? And they're trying to kind of trick him and catch him up. And, and so Jesus says, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. And then he presents the second commandment out of Leviticus. The second is like this, love your neighbor as yourself. There are no commandments greater than these. And so if I'm going to just leave you guys with with two kind of big points today, it's that uh, number one, loving God starts with listening to him. That If you want to love God, you've got to hear him. Um, the change that I went through in the secret place where I, I, I had to confront some of the things that I wasn't trusting him in. Like I had to really confront those and, and go, okay, God, I need, I need to repent. Like I need to actually, I need you to change my thinking and change my mind. Um, and experiencing issues like loneliness in my life, um, the need for human validation, those things God had made promises to me that I was not listening to. I wasn't grabbing hold of. And um, I said, Lord, I, I, you know, and I, and I think the main thing is I wasn't committing sufficient time to just sit with him and allow his promises to shape my thinking, right? You actually have to sit with the Lord to allow his promises to shape how you think and to, to change you from the inside out. Um, and I definitely was structuring my life around work and around family and just kind of hoping that I would have some time left over in my life for the presence of God or reading the word. Um, But it becomes this vicious cycle. It does. And I know you guys have experienced this, a vicious cycle of self-reliance where you're like, I can do this on my own. Like, I can figure this out. And so I just tapped in to the flow again, the flow of love that came through just sitting with him and listening and not choosing those mindless activities and those things that so easily distract and um, it's like, you know, I was at the YMCA. Um, I love the YMCA, uh, the Winston Y is my, my place. And I, I, I was filling up my water bottle and I, I found, you know how they had those, those water bottle, you know, dispensers that like save plastic bottles. And I just, man, those are awesome. Whoever invented those, like so quick, they're so easy. Long gone are the days where we were like awkwardly trying to fill up our bottles, you know. So I, and I, and I find this one, it's kind of like in this obscure area of the Y. And I see, I read on there, because you can see how many bottles it's saved, you know. And I read it's like 27,000 bottles. I'm like, oh, that's cool. But then if you go into like the main hallway or like the men's locker room, the numbers are like huge. It's like 300,000 bottles. Like there's so, many, there's so many more people filling up their water in those areas. And God just started speaking to me about how important position is. 
That the position, and businesses know this, right? The position of your business is going to attract attention, and that attention is going to fuel your business. But, like, position is important in our spiritual lives as well. Um, And I realized that, like, I hadn't been positioning myself to experience that flow. I hadn't been experiencing myself to really, and, and God wants us to make a choice. Like, he wants us to respond with action to his love and to position ourselves. Um, by daily practicing prayer and reading his word. These are the basics that I'm like, I wasn't always doing that. And I need to do that. And so, you know, if you're, if you're not a follower of Jesus and you're in here and you're listening and you're like, yeah, I don't know. I don't know if I even really believe any of this. And I don't know that I really will love God or do love God. Um, just want to tell you that um, before you or any of us can love God, we have to realize that we are loved by God. You have to realize you're loved by God, you know? And so this whole thing, everything I'm talking about right now, this fulfillment that I'm coming into, it all starts with his love, with receiving his love. First John 4 says, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God. Whoever's been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love God does not know God because God is love. And this is the love of God that was made manifest among us. God sent his only son into the world that we might live through him. And this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he's loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. So for, for any of us to love God, it starts with receiving and experiencing his love. And you are loved. I am loved. And it's beautiful. Um, the second thing is this second part of the commandment. Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself, which really starts with experiencing the love of God. I cannot love any of you or anyone, any of my wife or my kids. I can't love anyone if I don't have the flow of love flowing from God through me into others. I don't have it in me. I don't have it in me. But I love this this commandment thing because loving God and loving others, they're really just two sides of the same coin, right? They're, They're not, one is not better than the other, There is an order to it. You know, Jesus says there's a first and there's a second. There's an order to it. But they're really just two sides of the same same coin. Um, I think about, you know, we're all born into community. So we all are born into environments where we have opportunity to get around other people. And obviously it starts with our family and work out what does it mean to love. You know, but there comes a point where um, when we've experienced God's love, we actually choose to position ourselves around other people in order to experience that second commandment love, you know, the, the, to love others. And I think it's, it's why, um, you know, Jared shared about the building uh, that we're getting to uh, move into. And it's amazing. Like, this is a really exciting time for our church. Um, and next Sunday is going to be a really important Sunday for us all to come and hear um, what's going on and update on what's happening with the building. Um, so I just encourage all of you to be here. Um, but I just think about how awesome it is that we as a church are getting planted into a community where we can express God's love to a part of Jacksonville that probably really needs it, you know, that probably really needs to experience that. And uh, the other side of community that I just want to touch on real quick is community is a powerful way for us to hear from the Holy Spirit. You know, um, if you're not in or connected to a group or Christian community, like there's something more that God has for you. There's something great that he has for you. You know, we're, we're coming up to our, um, our city group launch. We're gonna be launching our city groups um, in a few weeks. It'll be on September 10th. That'll be the day that we kick off some new groups and some of our, our old groups will relaunch. And it's a really, really exciting time. And you know, one of the things that people love about RCC is that we do it in a round I know that's kind of weird right now because I'm sitting down and I haven't looked at any of you guys this whole time. Um, (laughs) But it feels kind of like we're in like a living room. People say, oh, I love worshiping in the round. It's kind of like you're worshiping in in a living room. And it's so intimate and family oriented. But even, you know, even in this space where we have a few hundred gather, it's really hard to, to bridge that, that gap of connection, to really have meaningful, deep connection and to have, you know, confession and forgiveness and accountability. And, and you know, we, we, we hear it during connect time and we know that it, it leaves this room out into the lobby. But um, what we, what we want to see for our church is for our church to live life in the round. 
You know, from, from a, not just going from Sunday to Sunday, just coming to worship, but living life together in around small communities, you know, groups, city groups around our city of people who can intentionally, you know, be accountability, be community, be authentic to grow spiritually together. And so, and community groups, I know, you know, for you introverts in the room, that's actually me, believe it or not. Um, I'm more introverted than extroverted. Uh, that might be hard to believe, but community groups are not just for extroverts. They're not just for the people who are just really excited to be around people all the time. No, they're, they're for everybody. Like everybody needs community to hear from the Holy Spirit. Um, if you don't believe me, go listen to John Mark Comer. He did this podcast on how we change. Um, it, I don't know if we have a picture or anything. Um, okay, well, John Mark Comer um, was the former pastor of Bridgetown Church. Um, he did a, he did a, a talk called um, Community, How We Change. And they're practicing the way series. If you have Apple, you can go um, you can go look that up and check it out. It's so encouraging. And you'll be sold. You'll be like, I need a city group right now. You know, you will, you will listen to it and be like, this is what I need. Um, and, you know, we love the celebrations. We love worshiping together, gathering here. We love baptisms and, and the excitement and the joy and, and the full worship team experience, which was awesome today. But I, I really believe that, re, you know, real growth on a deeper level happens in those groups, um, weekly community. And... Um, and so getting back to the city group launch, who has the church center app? Everybody hold up their phone. We're going to do a quick exercise right now. <laughs> quick exercise, okay? Um, if you're on church center app, I just encourage you to pull it up. Kevin Snow um, served us this week by creating an amazing little button right there at the bottom of your church center app, and it's called the city group registration Okay, the city group registration, we are trying to make it as easy as possible for you to join a city group. And we believe that anyone and everyone here should be a part of a city group and, and even outside of this room right now. We believe it's for everybody. We, we want everyone in our church to experience the power of community the power of groups. And so if you have your church center, you see that registration, I just wanna encourage you, you know, just fill this out. You know, you don't have to fill it out right now, but fill it out today. Because what we're going to do is over the next few weeks, and we're working with all of our city group leaders, and we're, we're trying to figure out, okay, where are our groups going to be? Where are they going to meet throughout the city? Who's going to lead groups? We're, we're, we're figuring out some of those things. And if we know who's ready and excited to be a part of a group, we can begin to start forming these groups. And so if you'll register for those groups today, that will really help us out. And then come September 10th, when we launch our groups, we're going to have just a really exciting day where we do somewhat of like a group expo where everybody meets each other and it'll be in, and it'll be part of our service where we meet with our groups, where we connect with our groups, where we in, we're invited to groups. And if people show up that day, they, they will be invited to join a group if they missed out on any of the announcements. But for the next two and a half weeks, we're having a registration, open registration. And I just encourage you, like, get plugged in because God wants to use you to love others in community. But God also wants to speak to you and encourage you and build you up through community. So that's my, that's my heart, that's my hope. Um, you know, and I just, I realize, you know, like uh, trust, in a lot of ways, trust is low for the institutional church and some people, and it's fine, it might not be the season for you to jump into a community, um, a community group, but um, there's a lot of questions that people have about church and, and where we're at. Um, Ed New told me a great joke this week. Um, if you know Ed, it's already funny. <laughs> so this shipwrecked guy lands on a deserted island and is stranded there for a number of years when he's finally spotted by a passing ship. A rescue party comes ashore and he's pointing, showing them around the island, pointing various huts he had built. Oh, that's my sleeping hut over there. That hut's my workshop. You know, there's my kitchen. And this hut, uh, this is where I worship. And a uh, member of the rescue party, okay, well, what's that hut over there? Oh, that's where I used to worship. <laughs> it's like we have this culture of just like just constantly shifting around. And, and I, I realize that. And I just want to acknowledge, I realize that trust can be low. But I just want to 
I just want to tell you, like, what we're trying to do here, what we're trying to build here is authentic community surrounded by love, infused with love. And I want to invite you to be a part of that because you don't know right now how good that will be for you. Maybe you do, but maybe you don't know. It's so good. And so I'm going to close in prayer and then invite Jocelyn to come up and lead us in some prayer ministry. Um, Father, thank you so much for today. I thank you, God, for um, just speaking to our hearts, God, for drawing us into a deep place with you. We want to love you, God, with all of our heart, with all of our soul, all of our mind, and all of our strength. We want to devote ourselves to you because we know when we do that, we find life. And God, if there's anyone in here today that has never experienced your love, God, let today be the day where they feel a touch from your Holy Spirit on their heart and they experience the love of the Father and the life-changing grace that you gave through dying for us and inviting us into your life. Lord, we thank you for the groups that are gonna kick off. We thank you for all that you're doing in our church, all that you're doing in our children. God, help us as a church to establish healthy rhythms of Sabbath and pace, even as we move forward into this week, which I know will be full of all sorts of busyness. I pray, Father, that you would just root us and ground us in love. In Jesus' name. Before you head out, if you haven't figured it out, if you're new here, we really believe in prayer. And I just want to pray for Pastor Tim as he steps into this new role, if you guys would join me. Um, what an incredible testimony. I love it when leaders come forward and share their weakness and share out of a place of what God is doing. And that takes a lot of guts and it takes a lot of just knowing that God is in control. And I love that he set that example. This was such a great way to start out this new ministry that God has for Tim. So would you just stretch forth a hand and we'll just pray for Tim. Thank you, Lord, for Tim. I just pray for more and more um, of you. I pray for everything that you have for him, Lord. I pray that you would just continue to shape his ministry to this um, family. I thank you for his transparency, his honesty, his humility as a leader. And I pray that you would fill him with more spiritual authority, power in the realms of praying for those of us who need it. I pray that you would just bless City Group and I just pray that he would continue to just be so aware of how you're shaping this community, what you want to do in these areas, Lord, with, with all of us. Thank you for his family. Thank you for the amazing, beautiful, creative Melissa. Thank you for the girls. I just honestly pray um, for every blessing over them, for protection. As a leader, you have just this big target on your back. The enemy doesn't like it. And so we just push that back and we say all things from the Lord for his family, hedge of protection around them, um, health, wellness. And I pray that we can all, as, as um, Tim grows up in this authority, that we would just all more and more be able to receive what God is doing, what God wants to do with us through um, the ministry that, that Tim's bringing. We thank you, God, for all that you're doing. Thank you for that word. We want to listen. We want to love in Jesus' name. Thank you, brother. That was amazing. Um, Thanks. <laughs> we, <Sure>. had, um, <laughs> we had a, a city group that we were helping lead with the Vitellis. And some of our longtime members, the Woodcooks um, over here, will you guys just stand where you are? The, uh, the Woodcooks, Brandon and Kendra, are actually going to be transitioning soon to South Carolina. And they have just been such amazing friends, um, but also just faithful lovers in this church. Um, Brandon serving often on drums, Kendra serving in other areas. And they're just, they, they know the Lord, they love the Lord, and we're sad to see them go. 
but we wanna send them out with a blessing. We wanna just cover them in prayer as they make this move to South Carolina. And I just wanna say like, oh, we're gonna miss you guys so much. Um, we love you guys, but we wanna pray for you. And as we move into prayer ministry, would you guys just kind of maybe come down over here? And then if anyone feels led just to surround them and pray for them as they make this move, I would, I would love that, so. Cool. I'm especially gonna miss Kendra's testimonies. Yes. They're some of my favorites.